All right, this is a video for session number 10, which is our last video. So congratulations, you've survived till the end of this course. The topic is perhaps not ending on a high note. The high note was our last session where we talked about IPOs and other ways to exit or harvest your business. Here we're saying what happens if you have trouble? Now what? What do we do? So let's look at the learning objectives for chapter 16. First is what is this financial distress and what are the tests that we see to indicate financial distress? Second is what is insolvency? What causes it and what can we do to avoid it? Third is turnaround. What are the things that we could do to turn around a failing company or at least one that's not in a good footing? Fourth is reorganizations. And what are things we could do if we know that just running the business is insufficient? We need some more radical change in our business or a legal standing. Fifth is looking at one of the ways that bankruptcy courts can be used to help a company. And it's chapter 11. Chapter 11 is the reorganization where you enter bankruptcy for protection and exit with a newly capitalized company with the chance to make money. And the last is chapter seven, which is the liquidation of the company in an orderly fashion for the protection of the creditors. At this point, the judges are not necessarily looking to help the shareholders. They're there to protect the creditors. So let's look at financial distress and what it means. So the, the basic idea is that we are running out of cash. We talked about the importance all along of cash and cash flow and things like the burn rate and runway. Well, if we don't have sufficient cash to pay our bills, we're technically insolvent. So the general use of the term is when you can't pay your bills. It's really that simple. But here we can look at some financial measures, how we would look at what is insolvency. The first is when we have a negative book value of equity. So you recall the accounting equation, assets equals liabilities and capital. But what happens if the assets are less than the liabilities? It can happen. And when that occurs, then the shareholder's equity is negative because the liabilities are greater than the assets. So that's the balance sheet perspective of insolvency. The second is, as a practical matter, is that you have bills coming due and you can't pay them. So this is a cash flow based definition of insolvency. All right, so as far as financial distress and your debts, Loan defaults are the first clue. Defaults, as we talked about, could be for technical reasons like you were late sending a, a report to the bank. Right, That's a pretty minor violation. However, a more serious or what we call actual default is where you can't meet your cash payments. Whether that's for the interest due or the principal amount that is due, you're short on cash and therefore you miss that payment. That's a very serious default. Not to say the other defaults are not serious, but this is a clear sign where you cannot meet the cash requirements under the loan. So when we have a default, how does the bank protect itself? And this goes way back to why those bank documents are so onerous, is that they want to protect the bank in events exactly like this. What happens if you get in trouble? First is an acceleration provision. We mentioned this in class the other day, that the bank can call the entire loan due immediately. So you may have a five-year loan and you're in year three of the loan. If you hit a certain level of default and the bank gives up on you as a good paying customer, they may just call the loan. So even though you think you have two more years to pay the loan off, you don't. The bank, because of the rights they have under the loan agreement, can just accelerate and call everything due now. The second is where there is a cross default provision. And so this is one where we have an entity, call it company A, and it wants to borrow money. So in the negotiations with the bank, the bank says, oh, you know, I see you have company A and you also have company B as a sister company or a related company, if not a sister company. Why don't we do this? We'll lend you money to company A and we'll have a cross default where if you default on one, it crosses over to company B as well. This protects the bank. So if bank loan to both A and B and they have this provision, if one's in trouble, it can actually call into, into play provisions to protect the bank on both company A and company B. You can see that a banker would be smart to do something like this if they're loaning to the two entities. Next is a foreclosure where the bank looks at the situation and doesn't think that the company will make it on its own. So they start implementing foreclosure proceeding, which means that they can take over the assets of the company. Some may have been pledged as secured items, or they could foreclose on the general assets of the company as well. So this is when it gets really serious, where the bank is going to put you out of business because they're going to start taking assets that you probably need to run your business. 
Next is balance sheet insolvency. And this is what we talked about earlier, the very simple definition, very clean and easy to see. If assets are greater than liabilities, then you have negative net worth and you're insolvent. And in this exa example of Northland Industries, the initial equity was 200,000 and they spent 100,000 on current assets, 100,000 on fixed assets. But once they start having losses, for example, year one, they lose 100, year lose two, they use, lose 150, the balance sheet then looks like this. They have year one looks fine, as you can see. They have assets and no debt and just some equity. Year two, they're starting to slip where we have $200,000 of assets, but now we're gonna incur some debt of 100 and we have total equity of 100 and we're now showing a little bit of strain. Still not too bad, we're 50% debt, 50% equity. Year two is when we get in trouble. Year two, we lose another 150,000 and that burns up all our equity. So at this point we have $200,000 of assets, but now our debt is rising and the debt as you see of 250 is greater than the assets we have of 200 and our equity is negative 50,000. So we at this point are technically insolvent. Year one, you see some problems where you, you're going from zero debt to now 50% of the assets are paid for via debt. And year two, you definitely see the problem where you've gone upside down, if you will. You have more liabilities than you do assets. So the other form of insolvency, as mentioned, is not on a balance sheet, assets and liabilities, etc. It's on cash flow. You have things you need to pay for. They could be operating items like rent, payroll, or they could be other expenditures you're obligated to pay, like leases or debt repayment. So in this example of Westland Industries, we had $100,000 of equity and we did some asset purchases. Year zero, we had no sales, but we had some costs of 50,000. So we ran a loss that year. In years one and two, we had sales of 100,000 per year, but we have operating assets before depreciation of 75% of sales, plus we have interest costs. So let's see how this looks on the statement. On the Westland financial statements, year zero, we see that we had sales of 50, operating expenses of 50, so we had zero EBIT. Year two, we had 100 in sales, 75 of operating, but we had expenses for interest of 20. So we're 5,000 EBIT, but projected year two, we're seeing that our sales are not rising and our debt is rising. Therefore, we need to have higher interest payments and we're going to pay fifth. I mean, $40,000 of interest on an EBITDA of 25, and now we're underwater, 15,000. So we're unable to pay our, our bills. The other example is a principal-induced cash flow. And this is where we have investments again for Eastland Industries of 100,000 for uh, assets, both current and fixed. And then we have depreciation expense of 20,000 for years one and two. We lose money in year one and 70, year two of 20 and we're starting to need more working capital because as we discussed, as your sales rise, so do your receivables and your inventory. So at the end of year, we also have payment due of 50. So let's see how this would look for this entity. So in year zero, you can see no net income, but we had assets we purchased, working capital, fixed assets, and we had some infusion of capital. So uh, no cash bill that year. Year two, we had a loss. We had some depreciation, but we still had some loss uh, beyond just depreciation expense and we're now having additional need for um, capital in this case hundred thousand dollars year two we have an income we broke through we have positive but our increasing working capital necessary to support our growth is 70 which outstrips the cash we get from running the business so we also have a debt repayment due of 50 and now our cash is burning to, uh, eighty thousand. So notice in year two, we're burning cash even though we're earning profits. Whereas in year one, we were losing money, but we had no burn because we had available capital. So this is a principle-based measure looking at, do we have the financial capital that will sustain the operations even though we may be burning cash from an operating standpoint? All right, so if we get in trouble, what do we do about it? Well, logically, there are three ways that we can address it, and this could be one or all or some combination of these items can be done to address the problems. There are operations, financial, and asset restructuring. So operations are what you would expect. Can we fix our revenue problem and get more revenues? Or can we cut costs so that we have more revenues than costs? There's no magic to an income statement, right? 
So we might change our sales strategy. Maybe we move to or from direct sales with our own sales force, or we use channel partners as sales and just pay them on a variable basis like commission. Or may, perhaps we go online, either in part or in whole, to have a lower cost, hopefully a lower cost way to sell our products. Second, we can cut our overhead. These could be people, staffing costs, or it could be marketing budgets, or travel and entertainment budgets, or R&D. These are, these are common things that are done to try to stem the cash flow, the outflow, even though we might be sacrificing our future or the quality of our service. We're willing to make those trade-offs in order to stay alive. It's not a nice choice to have to make, and it's painful sometimes to even think of doing these things, but you must do what you need to do to keep going and, as they say, fight another day. The third is you can shrink operations. You can look overall geographically, let's say. Are there certain regions that don't make sense and you have to close those out and come back later on when you have capital to sustain the attack? Or they could be lines of business. They could be certain product lines or older products. So there may be things we could do to shrink our operation. All right, so next we'll look at the restructured forecast. And this is a revenue expansion scenario. So that is our restructuring. Revenues go up in this scenario from five to six, a 20% rise. Our cost goods sold, say the same as a percentage at 60%. So 60% of 6 million is 3.6. And all the other costs stay the same. Our general administrative marketing costs are the same. So we go from break even at zero uh, EBITDA to now a positive 400,000. So that's one way to do it sell your way out of it. The other is cutting your cost your way out of it. So the middle is what we saw prior, but on this scenario, we keep our revenues the same at 5 million. Our cost gets sold also are same at 60% or 3 million, but here we're cutting our costs. GNA and marketing costs are both tacked and we save in GNA by 400 and that drops straight to the bottom line and now we're making a profit. The other form is asset restructuring. So here's where we have working capital or fixed assets that we want to address, working capital. So here we can look at selling some receivables. We could trim our product line, therefore to reduce our inventory requirements, cut the level of inventory, or we could outsource manufacturing, which would have us have lower amount of inventory because now we no longer have to have raw materials, work in process and finished goods in a typical manufacturing environment. We can instead buy from the outside, maybe pay a little bit more per unit, but not have to hold inventory and not have to have factories. The other is we can look at our fixed assets. We can look at our utilization of our assets, our facilities and say, we can sell some unused or underperforming plants or warehouses. We could also, as we discussed in other financing alternatives, a couple of lectures ago, do a sale leaseback and that would generate some cash in exchange for payments into the future. Next is looking at the example of working capital. And here we have web tech again, and the middle column is business as usual. But here we're not only looking at the balance sheet, we're looking at the income statement because both will be affected when we attack working capital. In this scenario, we have revenues stay the same, but because of our tighter management, let's say, we find a way to trim our accounts receivable from 500 to 410. We find a way to trim our inventory from 600,000 to 493. So therefore, we're able to cut down our need for debt and that will lower our loans from 800,000 to 604. So what we've seen is in this particular case, we did nothing to the underlying profitability of our sales. What we're doing is increasing our management intensity and therefore the results on receivables and inventory. This is an example of two measures that we used before. The first is the business as usual scenario where we had day sales outstanding and inventory conversion of 36 and 73. So it was taking us 109 days to handle those two front end pieces of our business. And now we see that the industry is averaging better on both 60 days on the inventory and 30 days on receivables. And what if we can then change our operation at, to at least get to industry averages? And so on the bottom left, we see receivables. What happens if we now move to 30 days and we get to the 410? You see on the bottom right, the inventories. If we move from where we are now to the industry average of 60, what would that mean for inventories? And the net result is this, where we have no change in our profitability, but we do change the intensity of our management. So assets are going to be collected faster by way of receivables and then inventories are lowered even though we have the same level of sales. So we have higher inventory turns, faster collection, and those have the effect of reducing the debt load on the business. Next, we look at financial restructuring. Here, we're looking at some of our obligations. 
These could be debt or it could be leases even, but we're trying to change it so that we either owe less or owe it later on. I mean, those are the basics when you're in survival mode, owe less money or pay them later. So first on the debt repayment, uh, we can change the interest terms, either lower interest rates that save us money, or if we can't lower interest rates, push it out into a slower amortization of the principal. We could change the composition. For example, we may have current accounts payable due say in 30 days, and let's say we're late. Well, we can stay being late, hurting our credit as it's reported to the agencies, or we can approach that vendor and say, you know, we owe you X amount of dollars. We're having some financial difficulties to pay, and we believe we've got it together. We know how to return to profitability and cash flow, but we need you to accept payment in a longer period of time. So let's put what we owe you into a note that bears interest that we'll pay you and we'll pay you over three years instead of paying you in say 30 days. Next is lease renegotiation. You could change the terms of lease. One might be lower the rate itself, the price per square foot. The other is to terminate some leases from space you don't need or some excess space. The second is change the size of facilities. So you shrink say the warehouse you're using so that they can release it to somebody else, a portion or all of that warehouse. Or we might be able to get a sub lessee to sublease part of our space. If we have a big warehouse and we're only using half of it, can we find a compatible company to lease the other half and pay us at least rent so we could pay off some of our rental payments with our money plus the money we get from subleasing it to another person. Next are workouts and liquidations. Here's an example where we negotiate with someone. Here in a private workout scenario, we have the owner of the venture and we have creditors and we want to find a way to amicably work it out so that we structure it. And you might say, why would somebody restructure the obligation? Answer, some money is better than no money. So in this particular case, you demonstrate a bit of your vulnerability as a business and you talk to the creditor. We can be out of business or you can give us a little space to write our ship, fix our problems, and therefore you have a chance of recouping your money. So it's, it's not a nice choice presented to creditors, but they're business people. They want to know, is it better to have some money later or no money now? And in private liquidations where we transfer the asset that we're working with and we transfer it to somebody else and we liquidate it and use those proceeds to say pay someone else. In our class together next week, I will give you examples of how I've used various ones of these either for my own company or with other companies.